Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave with a, well, this is both a show and tell and a, a one day build for shop infrastructure. I have to admit every now and then I build stuff while you're not looking. That's totally something that happens. And it's often based on the fact that I kind of need to build something and just be concentrating on the building entirely and to not be thinking about the storytelling. It's a mode I love to do clearly because of all the content I put on here. And there are times when I don't want to have to think about that. And when we wrapped Silicon, uh, the pop culture con I threw, I throw in, in, in San Jose every year, the lead up to it took a tremendous amount of energy. And at the end of any project like that, I always have a little bit of a, a, a dip creatively, emotionally, there's just um, a reset. Uh, I, I have learned this about myself over the years. And so I prep myself for it. And I think, you know, go easy on yourself. Don't try and line up too much right as soon as you're done. You know, you want to give yourself a little time to reset and wrap around the gear switching. So when I finished Silicon this year, I realized I wanted to make this tool. And this is a clamp knurler. And it is a, I came in here without plans and without, yeah, mostly without any plans. And I built this. It's not my design. The original structure of this clamp knurler was in, uh, used by a company called Marlco, M-A-R-L-C-O. And they made a clamp knurler that you can still find on eBay. They're terrific. Knurling is the process. Let me start there. Knurling is the process of putting a pattern like this diamond pattern here on this knob. Knurling doesn't have to be a diamond pattern. It can be a straight pattern. You've seen little uh, adjusting knobs on cameras often have little ridges. That is also, those little ridges are, are, are created through the same process, knurling. So that the knurling wheel for straight ridges is straight and the knurling wheel for diamond pattern are two opposing hardened steel wheels. And these two things are the only things I did not make here because you can buy these. You can buy these for like seven bucks a pair. You can buy small, medium, large uh, diamond cut and small, medium, large flat cut. I have all of those. Uh, and so I made my knurler so I could swap out the wheels. That was one of the features. But the inexpensive way to knurl is to take a tool that is usually a, a clevis of steel, that is a, a, a bar of steel with a notch cut out of it and a pin that goes through the wheel. And you just, you put that in your tool post, you clamp a piece of work in your lathe and you just push the wheel really hard into the piece. And this is, this puts a huge amount of pressure in the wrong way to the bearings of your lathe. I have a big lathe, so it can take that, but it's not like, it's not like you want to do that. So a clamp knurler is beautiful because per its name, it clamps on both sides of the work. All this will be apparent later. I'm going to use this and show you how it works, but it clamps on both sides of the work and thus takes all the stress out of the machine. And I have long wanted a clamp knurler. I used a cheapo one, uh, like $20 clamp knurler to make the knurl on my lightsaber recently. You can see this shot here of that knurler in action. And that one worked great for what it was. And I decided to make one a lot prettier. Uh, so Marco, like I said, uh, came up with this design and then Hemingway kits. And I have built their kits before. Um, they are kits in the real truest sense of the word because they don't do any of your work for you. You get like a cast iron piece that is not squared and not drilled out or anything. It's just the raw cast iron. And then you get steel chunks for the rest of it. And you get a set of plans, two or three drawings in order to, to make your parts. And the tolerances are all listed and uh, there are pictures of it. Hemingway Kits um, is a wonderful, wonderful company. Uh, like I said, I have built this, uh, this Toolmaker's Vice I built using one of their kits and I use this all the freaking time. This is a fantastic device. It is uh, very useful to me. And it was one of the first Hemingway kits I made. And they make a clamp knurling kit. Why didn't I build their clamp knurling kit? It is simply because when I finished silicone, I was so, I didn't know, you know, I never know what the reset's going to be like. Not to say I don't know how long it's going to last. It's usually about a week or two, but like, 
I didn't know how I was going to work through the week after Silicon. It's, that Monday occurred and I thought, I want to make a clamp knurler. And I just, I don't want to wait whatever it'll take a week or two for to order one and get it here. I want to start building it tomorrow morning. And so I just sat there, looked at pictures of Hemingway's clamp knurler and Marco's clamp knurler until I understood their structure, which is, there's some interesting complexities to the structure, which I'll reveal as I, as I put this together. It is an ingeniously compact design that applies a huge amount of uh, reinforced force to the work such that your lathe, like I said, receives none of that abuse. I will build another one of these on camera. That will be a one day build. The reason we're looking at it today is because this tool is going in the, 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 the knurling drawer of my lathe tools cabinet. And I want to make a holder for it and for the various sizes of uh, hardened steel knurling cutting wheels that I have. Right, I wanted to pause for a second and talk about making a tool. There are few things more addictive to me. Um, I made a tool over COVID, actually, I'll grab it. I made this base for my uh, chop saw. Uh, I made the vise. I made the ability to move that vise. I made a stop for that vise. Uh, and I did this all with the same kinds of materials, brass, cast iron, basically scraps I had here at the shop. And when I built this, I, I really stared at it for days, seriously. Uh, and there's something really particularly special about making a tool that I find more satisfying than most other objects. Because there are aesthetics, but there's also the aesthetics of how well it does, how well a tool does its job is part of a tool's aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, it may even be orthogonal to our idea of visual or tactile aesthetics, but it's there. And I specifically made this thing with very little adornment because I, I didn't want to show off. I wanted to show, right? Just, just the facts, ma'am. Just what you need to get this across the line. What, is, what does it take? Uh, and I've already used this several times and it works just perfect. I will utilize this in this video, but here, here you go. That is a sample I did just to show someone yesterday. The nice fat diamonds this makes. All right, where was I? I was saying this thing is insanely simple as a design and really robust in how it applies the force it needs to apply and really simple in its execution. It took me a while to wrap my head around all the parts of its mechanical arrangement. Uh, and part of the reason I'm shooting this is because I want it to be easier for the next person thinking about building their own clamp knurler. Uh, and by all means, you should go get the Hemingway kit because it has everything that you need. I had a bunch of extra scrap iron. I didn't need their pieces and parts, it turned out. There is a link to Hemingway's kit in the description. Uh, and if you want to try this, you totally should. But I will assemble this now on camera and walk you through uh, its various components and how it works. The clamping force of this is all maintained by, a pay, uh, by three pieces of brass. Actually, I guess two pieces of brass. Um, this spindle here, which has rounded uh, posts, and it is a single piece of three quarter inch brass machined with a flat on it and with two uh, quarter inch posts. Uh, and this is the top of the clamping force. And I'm just gonna screw this knob down. Uh, I actually cut the threads on this 3 8 24 rod myself. I don't recommend doing that. I have since obtained a bunch of stainless 3 8 24. I like the 3 8 24 specifically because it is the kind of fattest plus highest thread count metal rod at this scale. Uh, why do I want the highest thread count? I want the highest thread count because uh, if I just had a 3 8 16 or 3 8 18, that's 18 or 16 threads per inch, every time I turn this, I'm moving this a certain amount, 1 18th of an inch or 1 16th of an inch. When it's 24, I'm moving it 1 24th of an inch. So I basically have finer control 
over uh, how this works, uh, sorry, over the clamping force when I have more threads per inch. My clamp knurler is also missing a key feature that the Hemingway kit has, which is a, uh, a clamping arm. It is still possible for me to add that feature into my knurler, and I think I'm going to do it on the next one instead of try and retrofit it into this one. It was just one extra step of uh, sort of mental capacity that I eliminated to make this build a little more straightforward. Um, so there is the, the, the top of the clamping force and the bottom of the clamping force is another brass plug, also three quarters of an inch, also with quarter inch posts on it, except that this one has a set screw which captures it here. Uh, and that means that as I open them up, uh, th this, uh, this doesn't come out. That is how the clamping works. When I, uh, when I open, when I open this, when I close this down, it brings these together. When I open it up, it moves them farther apart. And therein is all the action inside of the clamp knurler stems from those two pieces. To put the captured nut on there, you want it captured. So here's a little set screw. Uh, I actually custom turn this set screw so that the end actually fit nicely in there without chafing it. I didn't want to mark it up. And also I don't want to put it in so far it actually uh, touches that center piece. Great, great, great. The real trick here is that that capture screw can't be proud of the uh, outer barrel of that plug because it sits inside this piece. And the reason for that will be really clear very shortly. Um, so this is one of the jaws that does all the clamping. Uh, sorry, that applies. This is the jaw that takes the force from these plugs moving apart and applies it out to the wheels. So actually, why don't we put in the wheels first? Because like I said, I have many different kinds of wheels. Uh, let's see, yeah, we'll do this like that. Uh, and I have these little plugs. These I also did not make. I scavenged these from a clamp knurler because I liked that they had these little low profile fat head, flat heads. And the flat head means that I can get, this is how close I can get to the work. Less than a, that's actually just about a hundred thou. Um, and it allows me to get right up to the edge of a lip if I need to. Uh, same thing on this one. And these uh, little clevis pins are held in by circlips. Um, circlips are a technology for securing something when you don't have a lot of uh, room. And they allow for a very low profile securitization of pins. I'm gonna hold one of these up for you so to see it up close and personal in a second. So here you can see the countersunk flat head in there sitting inside of that. It's only a hundred thou from there to the wheel. And then here is the circlip. You see, it's just that little bit of hardened spring metal that goes into that little slot and captures this. Um, all the force is going this way. So I'm not worried about that shearing off. That can handle a, a huge amount of force. I'm also not worried about how small this arm is. Given how cheapo the clamp knurler I used on the lightsaber was, I feel like this is plenty of meat. Um, this entire thing is held together with uh, two screws and three dowel pins. A dowel pin is a piece of semi-hardened steel with chamfered edges. These come in standard lengths. Uh, they come in all sorts of standard diameters, metric and imperial. Uh, and it's great to have a complement of them in your in your shop. So one of them goes in here. Yep, that's that side. And it's mostly just centered between the two and the other two go here and here and that one. Yep, like that. Oh, right, and there is one more. And we have, now these two pieces 
end up being the other part of the equation that applies the clamping force. The plugs, it, uh, the, the plug here goes through the top hole, the post here on the bottom goes through the bottom hole, and the post here in the middle slides in this slot right here. So here's, get this going. This is going to be a little greasy because I really like to use a lot of oil when I'm doing... Oh, whoops. forgot that too quickly. Yeah. Great. All right. Now we have most of the structure. And that sits on this underplate. Now, the, the best part about this structure is that it is in what I like to think of as an H arrangement in which the two tall stalks of the H are these two flat sides. They sit here on either side of this equation, and this piece sits between them. So this goes in here and sits uh, here, and that is the entire structure of this device. Again, very, very nice and low profile. I really dig it. Uh, these capture, this slot captures the body of the clamper. This slot, the opening up of this slot allows for the smooth movement of these, but they have no mechanical thing holding them to this except for these flaps. It's really brilliant. So uh, we will put this like this. We will put this like this. We put a pin in there and a pin in there. Yep, there we go. Now, uh, there's one other aspect, which is you notice these holes here on either side of this, and there's corresponding holes in the insides of the arm. That's where the springs go. And so uh, the springs actually are not a mission critical feature of this build, but they are very, very useful feature um, and hard to install actually, or just a little bit of a pain to install, just a tiny bit. That's it. Great. Okay. So now I've got the springs in here. Yep. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I've got the springs in here holding this to center. And what you can see is I'm now going to have to drop, pull this out, drop this plate on here. And then I sink these two uh, uh, button heads through and they should give me the structure that I'm looking for. So drop those like that. Put those in here like that. Now they come on through, holding this down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, look at that. We're almost there. We're almost home. Now this guy sits there. And once I, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. And now what's funny is I'll bet you don't need both of these bolts to hold this thing together. I'll bet that is enough. And so you can see, right? I uh, I turn this clockwise to clamp it down. I open it up by turning it counterclockwise. It's self-centering. That's what the spring ends up giving it is a, both a ability to sit close to center, but also kind of move back and forth. And then we'll clamp this down and the machine itself it's complete. Oh my God. I literally can't tell you how beautiful this thing feels to me. Um, every champer, every chamfer, every edge has been lovingly treated by me with files and steel wool and scotch bright. I really worked this over to, and it feels great. There's no, there's no rattling, rattling. My tolerances are all within a couple thou, um, if not way less. Uh, I'm just, I, this sat on my bedside table for five days after I finished it. I actually kept bringing it in to use it and then bringing it home. <laughs> I assembled it backwards. So awesome. Okay, uh, let's reassemble it.
This pin, the fact that it moves, allows the direction of this to apply a wonderfully consistent amount of force to this top arm and the the force it brings. It allows that angle to change slightly, which it does as it opens up, and still apply the same amount of force. Yeah, it has a good side and a bad side because it sits here on the in the, in one of my um, multi-fix uh, tool holders. So that sits on the right. The labels on the left. I've actually adjusted all the the dowel pins. No, same orientation. Um, this is actually held onto the rod using Loctite, but I also um, I actually made this knurl with this tool by using vice grips and they damaged the thread slightly, but that was fine because once I screwed this down and added Loctite and kind of held it all together. So that's never letting go. Um, there you go. That's the device. Here are all the knurling wheels that I want to display with it. And frankly, I want these labeled as to what they are so I can easily pull them out. And I need a little bit of a holder for some extra circlips. I almost lost one of these just now by dropping it. And I have more. They're just over there in the sorting cabinet. So again, if I'm going to be swapping out these wheels, I want the extra little circlips to be there so that that's an easy operation. This here, whoop, knurling tools. That is the drawer it's going to go in. What are these wheels? These are larger knurling wheels. I Those are just, they're artifacts from other knurlers that I had. I don't need to worry about those. But so, yeah, my block is going to fill some of this space, and I'm going to make it out of some uh, inch thick. Is that an inch? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to make it out of some inch thick MDF. So let's get started. That's the void to cut out there. And then as far as these guys, I guess, ah, right, how big is, how big is that thing? Uh, hang on, six and seven sixteenths. Right, so let's see here, what do we got? Five? What do you mean five? Where's that one? Oh, oh, oh. There it is. Okay, so what do these do? Yep. That's one. That's two. That's three. Okay, so what I have here are seven pairs, and I probably want eight. So we've got a uh, straight neural. Light, medium, and heavy. We've got diamond neural, light, medium, 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 and heavy is here. That's heavy. So if that lives like that, I'm kind of inclined to cut this here. Yeah. And then these guys would sit, uh, do I really want that? I kind of would rather it be like this. Yeah, that makes sense. So one, two, three, four, five, 
X. Okay. I want that. And then each of these could, I don't even have to label them because I can see them. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. I think that's how I'm going to do this. And then I'll just have a little on that side. So this gets cut off. This will be used to make that. All right. My whole spacing is not my whole spacing is not perfect because I added wrong. That one's a little fatter, but that's fine. They're all else pretty great. Let's just double check that they fit. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. We're gonna try ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, I only need to cut that one. Very cool. All right. That's gonna glue there like that. Uh, yeah, they're just wide enough. That's wonderful. <laughs> so we're gonna give this some glue. thing that glue did. Awesome. We're going to add a little mechanical strength to this just because I like mechanical strength. Add a couple of screws and I'm going to count the same thing. It is almost complete. The knurler sits here. The knurling wheels all sit here. Uh, I'm going to mill out two, uh, three uh, little recesses. One will be for circlips. One will be for other stuff. And these will be for the larger knurling wheels. Oh, there we go. That's a respectable looking thing. 
Let's put it in the drawer. Yes, I love organization. Oh, oh, oh. Wait a minute. Really? No, oh, that should fit. Oh, right, but it doesn't. Okay, so. It does fit, but in getting this in there, I need to create a little bit of a relief for the thickness of this, and I'm gonna use this end mill that I had. Holy cow, look at that. Yeah, this is gonna be beautiful. Let's install it. I have one other option if this doesn't work, but I think this should work. Here we go. Ah, all right, I wanna put a little bit of relief there. Bellissimo. I love it. So these guys can all live here. Isn't that lovely? I got straight neural heavy. Uh, I got straight neural, probably medium. Nope. Yeah, that's it. That's, yeah, so we'll go. That's straight neural heavy. That's medium. That's light. This is diamond medium. I have extras here. I don't need them all, which is fine. Oh, right, right, right. Circles. All right. Here we go. That's it. Five extras. There we are. Now, ah, uh, are you kidding me? It's bumping the fragamurgamurgamur. Fragamurgamurgamurgamur. All right. So I'm just going to take off about. 250 thousandths off of the bottom of this thing. I'm gonna use this same bit because it's plenty. I'm gonna start with this end because that's the most delicate chunk. These big milling bits are dangerous. You should be careful around them. I watched one of them take off the tip of someone's finger once. I am very cognizant of their danger as I utilize them. All right. Presumably that might be the last step. All right, same view. Different optimism. You, you, you live there. Did I? Did I really do that? Did I somehow spill the extras? I think I did. That's insanity. All right, I'll find those. I have many. That goes there. That goes there. These guys. Up there. And I believe. There we go. Ha! Ah! Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please. I'm very happy with this. Yes, all right. Day by day, inch by inch, sorting drawer by sorting drawer, my mill and my lathe get more and more refined and more intuitive as tools that I use all the freaking time. I am so happy about them. Thank you guys for joining me for this both tool tip, show and tell, and one day build. A little bit of, little bit of, it vent. There's a lot of vending going on. Uh, anyway, I'm Adam and I will see you guys next time. Cheers.